Uh, a very good morning to everyone. I, Assistant Professor Snitha Roy, welcome you all to the Geetham School of Architecture webinar series 2022 on the topic of successful career in architecture, organized by Geetham School of Architecture, Hyderabad and Vishakapatnam campus for all the aspiring students, practitioners and the educators and this series consists on every Saturday and Sunday, where we connect with all the national and international practicing architects worldwide, and where they share their journey. And uh, I'm really glad that uh, Deepankar has accepted our invitation. So I welcome you all to this webinar session. And with indeed honor, I welcome our director, sir, Professor G. Sunil Kumar, sir, all our associate professors, assistant professors, and it's a, uh, it's really uh, an honor and uh, a very great thing. And uh, so with, uh, so now after introducing our, uh, now it's time to introduce our today's presenter, our today's guest speaker, and I will give a brief introduction. So welcome architect Dipankar Das Sharma. So a brief description about our guest speaker. Uh, the Pankadar Sharma has done Bachelor's of Architecture from Shushan School of Art and Architecture, Delhi, and Master's from in uh, Architecture from RMIT, Melbourne, Australia. He is a RAI member and also QA registered architect in Delhi. And uh, the Pankadar Sharma, based in Melbourne, Australia, is an architect and also a researcher who is currently working at Australian Architecture Organization, Nettles and Strikes. He strives to produce architecture that is user centered, possess possesses humanitarian values and aims to make a difference to the social infrastructure. After completing his Bachelor of Architecture, as I said, from Shoshan and pursued his Master's of Architecture, he received many future leaders scholarship and he was also a recipient of the scholarship offered by the Architectural Association London for a visiting school in Stuttgart, Germany, Germany in 2017. He has won also numerous national and international awards for his Master's thesis informing her surgery and his bachelor's thesis, Researchation and Reinterpretation of an Architecture Icon. This includes Architecture Master Prize 2021, Global Architecture and Design Awards 2021, Reba 2017 as a nominee, and NIASA NIASA 2016 MCOA. Uh, and his work has been published and featured on numerous online and offline platforms, including in a book by the Council of Architecture India. So welcome the Pankar. And uh, I'm really glad to have you. Thank you for accepting the invitation. So let's connect with Dipankar today and looking forward to his journey and experience. So over to you, Dipankar. Welcome. Um, thank you so much, Nikta. It's an honor to be here and present amongst um, all our peers. Um, I'll just share my screen and you can let me know if you can see the screen. Yes, it's visible. Is it? Okay. Yes, yes. <clears throat> okay. Uh, thank you to the Dean and all faculty members for having me here to present my brief journey and work through this webinar. Also, I just added a prefix to the title calling it a work in progress. This is because I consider my journey to still be a work in progress than a successful one. I think the reason is because I feel like there is so much more to do and there's so much more that I can do, but I'm not even close. Today, I plan to share my brief journey from a first year student at Sashan School in Delhi to a practicing architect in Australia. The left is the image of uh, my first year uh, in the bachelor's and uh, on the right is the MARC um, final year. I don't plan to share any secrets or 10 ways to attain success. I'm pretty sure there are a lot of experienced professionals who would be better at giving an advice on that topic. Neither do I plan to share the exact timeline of professional events that occurred. I feel like we all are good at searching people on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram. And I tend to keep all my information posted. So if anyone's really interested, they can track me down on LinkedIn. What I do plan is to share the two important learnings during this brief ongoing journey. 
number one is figuring out my definition of what architecture is. I feel this is probably the most important one. Number two, the importance of value over success. I elaborate, I'll elaborate on both in the upcoming slides. So that's, that's the timeline for me, which is uh, first year to third year. So during the first three years in architecture school, I tried a lot to understand what architecture really is. This is because I come from a background where no one in my father's relation uh, was anywhere close to being an architect. And all I knew from a quick Google search was that architects design and construct buildings, which is right in a sense. In the meantime, in the school, they were teaching to look at context about building language, vocabulary, and all the philosophical things that I didn't really understand at that time. It was only when I started to educate myself through the vast sea of information that is at our disposal is when I started to understand all the things that were being taught to us at school. It started making all, all and a lot of sense to me now, and there was no going back. And this is when I figured out my own definition of what architecture meant to me. Architecture meant, architecture to me is the power to dream, to dream and to build better. And I don't know if you guys are a Spider-Man fan, but I was and still am. And the only thing that I could recall after figuring out my definition of architecture was Uncle Ben telling Spider-Man when he was figuring out his powers, with great power comes great responsibility. So I went back to my definition and decided to reiterate it. And I reiterated my definition to architecture is the power and responsibility to dream. Because unlike most art forms, architecture is something that, is, that has an end user. So no matter how interesting or fancy a design is, if it does not work for the end user, it has failed. Coming to the second learning, about value over success. There is a, there's a quote by Albert Einstein, which I really relate to, which is uh, to try not to become a man of success, but to become a man of value. For some reason, this makes me recall Amir Khan's movie, Three Idiots, where he tells his friends not to run after success, but being capable. Success will follow. And I truly believe that. For me, a man of value is a process that takes some time, but I trust, but trust me, this is not very complex. To become one, you have to find out what you love about architecture. Finding what you love about architecture will help you change your mindset. All the stress, panic that comes along with submissions and deadlines will become irrelevant as you would become more eager to show what you have produced in comparison to just uh, making the deadline in the given time frame. Second, be eager to learn. Being eager to learn is one of the most important things I've learned. <clears throat> Sorry. You always need to be willing to learn more regardless of the method you use. Seek knowledge, educate yourself, educate others. This is imperative because architecture is much wider than one can imagine. And it, is def and it definitely can't be taught in five years, regardless of what anyone says. Sorry to sound so depressing, but it is true. But you can make it easier for yourself by seeking information, educating yourself and others. This could include your batchmates, your friends, and your seniors. The next one is being attached to what you produce. Being attached to what you produce will help you to never give up. You will always find a way to make what you produce the best in all your capacity. The next one is being willing to stand out. One needs to have the courage to say what they truly believe in. You should do a thorough research and strongly back what you believe in. There is no harm in disagreements. You can disagree with your friends, your peers, your tutors, but you need to have a very strong backing. And there are no harm in disagreements because it only lets everyone learn more. Last but not the least, acknowledge what you don't know. Because 
that is the first step to begin uh, to begin learning itself. If you already assume you know everything, which is highly unlikely, there is no scope to learn. And that is why, depending on the situation, you need to learn more and you need to learn new things. And sometimes, depending on the situation, you need to unlearn what you already know. Just like sharing these two learnings about value and architecture, I plan to share two of my projects, no more, just uh, my master's um, major project at RMIT Australia and my final year thesis at Sushan School. Both projects were critical investigations that were very close to me and taught me a lot as a student and as an architect. Coming to the first project, informal surgery, it was a design experiment to dissect and examine an informal settlement, Kumbhagwara, aiming to surgically, surgically add a series of architectural objects and its prototypes to rehabilitate the residents of Kumbhagwara, the borders of Taravi, in an enhanced environment. Now, coming to some facts, um, uh, since I uh, presented this uh, project in Australia, not a lot of people were aware about what Dharavi is and what its conditions are and what the global uh, figures are when it's concerned to informal settlement. So according to UN's uh, population prospects report, 66% of the world's population will live in cities by 2050. Currently, 32% of the world's population lives in informal settlements. And most urbanization will occur in Africa and Asia with India, China, and Nigeria, will, uh, which will alone account for a third of that. As the world rapidly urbanizes, the livelihoods and health of all these people living in the informal settlements is at massive risk. And they have no property rights and they have no access to infrastructure. And a lot of these news that comes around um, all over the globe is uh, that the main aim of slum rehabilitation programs is primarily, primarily aimed at providing just four walls and a roof without uh, actually analyzing the necessities of the slum dwellers who have their own ecosystem. A lot of you guys who might have visited Dharavi would know that a lot of these people function on the ground floor and might have their bedrooms on the floor above or, or some other arrangement, but they have this ecosystem within them. And when they are transported to another location while they are, while a new project is going on, that plays a havoc with their own ecosystem because that's their living as well. So Dharavi, as we all, all know, located in Mumbai, India, is one of the top rankers when it comes to informal settlements. And it has an area of 2.1 square kilometers. So that's Dharavi. And Dharavi has an active informal economy, which, uh, which comprises of leathers, textile, and pottery products. Now, this is an interesting picture and uh, an interesting insight into Dharavi, that the dense and condensed nature, we always think that small is something where we can't design. But in contrary to that, in Dharavi, there's so much more than what an architect could think of while designing. So there's a strong sense of community, there's a strong sense of spatial adaptability, and every space has a lot of multi-utilitarian value. Now, coming to the state's proposal, these are the few images that I found on the government's website, uh, which have uh, always tried to redevelop Dharavi in multiple ways. But the only reason they don't succeed is because they fail to understand that Dharavi has their own ecosystem and their own habitat. And residents rely on their own micro enterprises to function and to gain their livelihood. So it's it's probably the most dysfunctional alternative making it into a city. This is one of the articles that I came across while doing my major project at RMIT when uh, Anne Lacaton, the Pritzker Prize winner in 2021. So what she says is, uh, when we look at landscape, we never think to cut trees, we never consider buildings and floors the same way. So what if we start looking at them like that, or looking what's positive inside uh, a particular site? What if we can transform and make, make additions to it? And for her, architecture must be done, urban planning must be done from the inside. 
So that's where uh, I started conceptualizing my research, which was it aimed to reevaluate the role of a current of, of, a, of, of an architect, basically, which is to step back from being a designer, because a lot of the times what we as an architect or as a designer do is we want to design the best um, in terms of what our know-how and what our knowledge is. But sometimes being an architect is also to examine the ex existing design in the site, which is why this research was aimed to reevaluate that role. Then uh, I didn't completely read this book, but a few chapters down, I read about Patrick Geddes, who uh, is very famous for um, surgical interventions, which is basically, uh, uh, I think all of us know what acupuncture is, but for those who don't know, it's it's pressing those pressure points so that you can relieve your human body. That's what he related architecture to. So if this is a site which has a problem, what if we could acupuncture that site? And he started calling that um, conservative surgery. And that, that, uh, there is another example by Aravina where the users were unable to fill the other half. So basically he provided a uh, build form a structure where the people would operate and they came and changed their surroundings according to their needs. So it was a 50% design by the architect and a 50% design by the users. And a similar example is Fry Auto where he, uh, this is in Germany, where he built a series of houses where the inhabitants were able to build their own nests. So they were able to like play around and make their own changes to the house. Now coming to my design, which was in Kumbarwara, which is the forest colony in Varavi. I identified all the things uh, and uh, in this particular potters community, these brick kilns where they produce their pots is very important. So I was trying to understand the fabric and what's going on inside this, this particular site. So from Barbara, which is spread over roughly 50 square 50,000 square meters, is like a hundred year old settlement where people from Gujarat came and it's a generation old pottery um, uh, setup. And while I was trying to understand what's happening at the site, so the ground floor was used as their workstation and the upper floor for residential purposes. And these, uh, so what I came to the conclusion after analyzing the entire site was that I need to address these three S's that I've identified at site, which is space, sanitation, and smoke, which is majorly the three problems that they have at site. So, the first point, the residents who tend to add additional floors as the family expands form the basis of one of my first rules, which was these incremental principles at site uh, for rehabilitation. Then the residents also have an acute shortage of sanitation, which is, uh, this is a rough ratio that uh, I think uh, was, was done by one of the analyses that was happen, happening at Barabi at the time, which approximated that 500 people almost 500 people use the same toilet. And the last was residents tolerate the dreadful smoke that emerges out of the kilns. And unfortunately, uh, this, this particular picture is very close to me because this th these, these kids also play around in the same area where all that smoke is. So yes, we know that there is a, not a lot that we can do, but uh, having that architectural power and having that architectural training eyes really do help you to empathize with situations like these and how can you make it better without completely sabotaging what's already there. So keeping the current density, uh, my research was to intervene at these sites. So Pat, uh, like how uh, Anne Lacaton or Patrick Gates said that you can, you can keep the existing and kind of acupuncture the, the site in a way that it releases stress. That was the major aim. So the first was to maintain these individual plot boundaries, which is the, these dimensions. And second was re retaining the block dimensions. So you basically don't plan according to the rule sets that are there for a typical urban plan uh, that would you would create where there's nothing at all. And third was to conserve the streetscape because there's a lot of multi-utilitarian value to the streetscape. They have their sheds outside, they commun uh, communicate with each other, they play with each other, they do their work together. So conserving the streetscape was immensely important. So 
my research operated in four blocks, which is this highlighted block. And what it started with was, um, it was it started with uh, with identifying the dilapidated and temporary structures. So these these houses which were of uh, which were very underused, uh, to then perform those surgical urban in insertions. I mean, it sounds a bit complex, but it's it's basically getting rid of the ones which are not massively used. So the first edition would be uh, so if this were to be the existing house, which is not as used would be proposing a sanitation facility there by replacing two houses. And the spaces can then be customized by the residents because one of the things that uh, I, I've seen in Mumbai for a while and I've interacted with the, uh, the people of Dharavi a lot, uh, a lot of these people are very playful in nature. They want their own colors. They want their own uh, textures and fabrics to be uh, on everything, even the buildings. So what I did was, I. Uh, I designed a framework where the where the sanitation can operate, but the space can be customized the, uh, through the residents with their own colors, textures, and patterns. So they bring color to the architecture. And that's another view of the sanitation facility. One thing I tried to do was uh, always go back to our traditional architecture and learn from them. And in this particular sanitation facility, I went back to the facility, uh, which is Bauli, which all of us uh, have somewhere um, like cross paths with or heard. And that's a traditional Indian step well. And it's a bathing space where you have very strong communal characteristics in the past. So having the same same set of rules uh, in this in this tight space, I tried to create that framework to have, have a mini Bauli, a miniature version of a Bauli. Uh, and try to do justice to the communal characteristics. And as I mentioned before, the, the people bring colors to the to the Bauli. And that's a fictional uh, cut through the same Bauli. So you can see like there are a few bathing spaces, there are uh, a few transition spaces and showering spaces. And you can you can kind of see like I've also tried to give them that op opportunity to create their own private systems if they want to. But this is majorly a, a place or a, a framework to operate in. And on the left is, is the framework, the steps, and on the right is the colors that are brought in by the, it, it's my interpretation of what the colors would be. Uh, if, if the proposal were to be actually be built, it, it could have a lot of different colors, but this is my imagination of what the colors could be when they bring in. And at the ground level, uh, just to expand the transitional possibilities, what I did was I tried to create this porosity at the urban level, at, at ground level, so that you can meander around the, the sanitation facility while you're doing your daily chores. And that's the plan at the ground level, a plan of uh, at like the first floor level. And this is this is a view at the higher level. Then coming to the second surgical insertion. Uh, so this is uh, three residential units in one building, if I had to put it in a very simple term. So identifying that existing structure, which is not very used, and I proposed a residential facility. Going into the details of the residential, before going into the details of the residential facility, it had, again, the same rules that I provide the framework and the people bring in their own distinguished colors, textures, and spaces. And this particular one was uh, the one which was taking inspiration from traditional Havelis, which had embedded courtyards. And the people who have been to Dharavi uh, know how hard it is to have a courtyard, let alone having, having a, a block to operate in or to just have a bedroom space. <clears throat> Sorry. So Calculating all the areas and getting all, all, all the block dimensions right, it was very hard, but still achievable to get a courtyard, a very miniature version of a courtyard in, in this particular block. But an earnest attempt was made to translate those qualities in this block. And this, this, is, from, this is the view from outside. This is the ground floor where uh, the first two levels, these are like the operating spaces where they can keep all their pottery products and still work. And the stairs take them to the residential spaces above. 
which kind of translates from the same principles that were observed at site working level below and residential top. And that's the plan at the ground level. That's at the working mezzanine level. And that's basically a section of, of how, how I imagine these to be. So this, this is one residential unit. This is another one, and this is another one. So three residential units and working spaces underneath. And same principle of bringing colors. This is this is probably a more uh, interesting perspective where you can see exactly. Um, I've tried to give them that incremental principle as well, which I'll discuss in the upcoming slides. So if if you look at just this this particular block. What, what it's trying to do is there's this kitchen and living area at the ground level, uh, at the base level and uh, around the courtyard. And then the bedroom space is on the level above. What I've tried to do is I've tried to uh, capture that incremental principle where they want to add an additional bedroom, which they usually do over their roof and keep that double heighted space where eventually they can have it and it can still enjoy the courtyard in the middle. So that is what it, it looks like, the double height space with the bedroom on top, the kitchen area at the back and the courtyard in the middle. And this is on the side of the stairwell. So that's that's the plan. That's a, that red dotted line highlights the incremental space that you can get later on. And the aim of the proposed stairwell, which is also very hard to get in the in the dimension, but I tried getting as, as close to it as possible was to provide transitional qualities and, and a relief. So a lot of these people don't just want stairs, they want to communicate with each other, they want to have interactions, which is which is what the site really needs. And the third, coming to the third insertion is a chimney to all the all the kilns that we saw in the in the first image of um, of Kumbarwara because of the smoke problem. So this this is just a series of um, how the chimneys would be added one two three and it, it keeps going on in the entire site. And the incorporation. So I, I was just looking into the construction of chimney as well. So it takes into account the traditional construction that we have in India, which is brick and concrete. But it would wouldn't be very feasible considering the Ravi's tightness to have it all the way up. So a steel uh, framework at the top to have achieve efficiency and which would basically look like uh, uh, this is the existing pottery kilns and you can you can have those chimneys to it won't completely absorb all the smoke but it's it's the basic idea is to provide that relief from smoke so you can at least go around those chimneys without having any breathing hazard and the fourth surgical insertion is an interesting one. So uh, I talked about the sanitation facility and these residential towers coming in uh, as an acupuncture um, to the existing porter's settlement. But this this fourth one is actually very interesting is because we already uh, made three residential families in these. So we have an opportunity to give this uh, this void uh, or this this particular house, uh, and like uh, if I had to put it in very simple words, just take it out of the site and give them a public space. And this one uh, reminisces uh, better, which is uh, like a lot of us who have been to Jaipur and who have been to places around. This is a very traditional form where people come together to discuss ideas and learnings and teachings and even for events. Um, so the idea was to give uh, people back that spot where they can discuss ideas in addition to what they already have. It, the idea was never to take what they already have. It's just to give an additional space, which was envisioned again by taking one dilapidated structure out and putting this, this space in, which can be colored and textured by the residents and which would, which would look somewhat like this. And uh, that, that, that's kind of how I operated on the four blocks of Kumbharwana. And this, this, this was more of a base model with four of this such punctures in the site and a couple of residential towers which can rehabilitate the people and having that sanitation facilities so of addressing all the PSs at site. 
and this this model can be expanded to all the all the uh, like the entire site of Kumbhagara and even the site the entire site of Dharavi, depending on how you analyze the other settlements. Like this one was an experiment with the Portis, but there can be other experiments with the other other uh, occupations that are at site. And this is one quote which kind of kept me driving throughout this research project project of mine, which is a quote by Buckminster Fuller, which says, when I'm working on a problem, I never think about beauty, but when I'm finished, if the solution is not beautiful, I know it's wrong. So that, I mean, uh, I, I can take a breather, but that's, that's informal surgery, my master's project. And now I'm going to briefly talk about my, my bachelor's thesis, which is Prakati Medan's re, uh, like, uh, resurrection of the architectural icon. And um, I'm not sure how many people actually know about Pragati Mazan, which was demolished in 2017. But just to keep everyone in the loop, uh, I've, I've spent my entire childhood in Delhi. So I, I was very close to Pragati Mazan. And seeing it get demolished was the perfect opportunity to take it as my bachelor's thesis because I was already so close to that, that place where uh, everyone enjoyed so much. So with Pragati Mazan, um, this, this is a, a an overview of what, what the research was. So Hall of Nations in 1972, which is this structure, I probably have a few images um, in the coming slides where I'll show the structure. So Hall of Nations in 1972 was built by Raj Rawal um, to celebrate 25 years of independence uh, of India. And uh, apart from my, my personal affection to the site, it, it was more how, how strong an architectural object this was. And not a lot of people know that space frames in um, Western countries or where I am in Australia usually are made out of steel. This was actually the first uh, first ever structure where a space frame was built out of concrete. And we were only able to do that because in India, we have a labor intensive, we are a labor intensive country. So we were able to build it efficiently. So it has a lot of uh, architectural and contextual background. And the second was, um, on a shift in our fabrication industry, which was this one where I was trying to uh, search how how we always think of buildings as boxes. And so does our fabrication industry. When we go out, everything is planar and it's available as sheets. Whereas what if our next paradigm shift would be making buildings curve, like all of us going Saha Adid, for example, but I, what I wanted to do is I wanted to interrogate like whether whether it's just for the beauty of it or is it is it the next way of building things as as a sustainably and uh, efficiently uh, built architecture. So that's that's a few of the interesting pictures that I found of all of nations when it was getting built um, uh, prior to 1972. And as you guys can see, there's a lot of complex processes that go behind and these people literally stay at the site till, till it finishes. And there's a lot of work that goes in, in making such marvelous structures, which some like, I, I'm not trying to be political, but some of the political decisions just don't uh, encompass how strong a feeling it has. And this is, this is uh, a picture of the built Hall of Nations. And 24th April 2017, thank God I have this in my presentation uh, because I completely forgot the exact date, was when the hall, uh, when these structures were demolished <clears throat> in order to get a new convention center facility in New Delhi. So four points that I had uh, during my bachelor's research, which I kind of was very, um, adamant on sharing was that the heritage we had was demolished, the global spirit uh, was ruptured in the sense that India had shown people that concrete space frames can be built and can be built efficiently because of the kind of labor intensive industry we have. So that was like a power and, and uh, in a way, uh, bragging about our capabilities of doing things. And then this was a monument for, uh, for all of these reasons. It was a, it was a translation of a traditional jolly into into a 3D jolly in a, in a, in in sorts. I think that's how uh, Rajiv will reveal um, 
explains it. And um, I mean, I could be wrong, but uh, that's that's what I remember because I saw a couple of his videos and I even met him during this period of time because there were a lot of petitions that were being signed and I was actively involved in all of those. Having said that I have all my submission deadlines and everything in mind, but I still used to make time because I was very close to it. And the last was beliefs, values, and culture slaughtered. So the question was, uh, what if it wasn't demolished? What if uh, Rajawal's uh, translation was having a 3D Hall of Nations? What if my translation could be a 2017 translation of, um, um, of, of the Hall of Nations itself? So I had uh, these three approach um, uh, in my, like the ones that I'd analyzed that was going on during the modernist era, which was uh, having a regionalist approach. So this is an example where um, Habib Rahman was able to translate um, Jama Masjid's Eastern Gate uh, and take that geometry and modernly interpret it into Maulana Azad Memorial. So this is this is the kind of regionalist approach I was looking at. Then the urban approach was, and, and this picture when I took during my bachelor's, I actually didn't know that I'll be living 15 minutes away from Fed Square. That's exactly where it is if I take like two trams. And the idea was um, that this 3.6 hectare site is very similar to what we have at Pragati Madan. So what if we could develop something which is internationally relevant? And third was to get all the technological backgrounds that we have at our hand in use to show the world that we are no less, we can build better. And the idea was to take the regionalist approach, the urban and the architectural approach, and somewhere around that circle would be the proposal. So just like any other uh, research study, I started with, um, with identifying the notable things at site. And, um, so this is India Kirit, the C hexagon, and this is Pragati Medan. So one of the things in Delhi is that uh, it's, it's built radially. And so it's very important for any architectural uh, figure that's coming up to identify the urban grid and respect that so that it kind of fall, falls to that, uh, falls um, in relation to or in congruency to that urban grid. So. This was this was a basic study of uh, building use with ground screens and the footfall at Pragati Madan. Then my site approach for this particular project was um, just like how India Gate. Um, I mean, so for those who don't know how India Gate, um, like most of us would know, but it, it's kind of on a pedestal. Like when you drive through the Rashtrapati Bhavan towards India Gate, it has a very strong sense of access, which. I'm not sure. I, I haven't been to India and my, New Delhi in a while, but I've heard that there are a lot of developments in Delhi now. But when I was building this, it had a very strong sense of access. And that's exactly what I wanted to have at Pragati Medan at a mini level, where there would be these progressive public spaces and the build forms would be built around, the massing would happen around it. And I kind of put the Hall of Nations, which is the rep, like manifestation of the celebration of 25 years of India's independence at a pedestal and celebrate and pay homage to the site. And these are few diagrams. I mean, I, I would have made better diagrams now, but considering it was my bachelor's, these are these are few sketches that uh, I was doing while analyzing the zoning of the convention center that would that would be in the future my architectural object that I'm placing at site, which were to translate the qualities of Hall of Nations. So this one is an interesting study. Why uh, why I say that is because this one is very geometric in nature. So I um, I tried to read, and and this is where I think the role of an architect is very interesting. Where I was talking about the other project, where in Dharavi it was very important to understand the existing design. Versus in this case, where I had to understand the existing design in order to facilitate the design sense that's there. So starting with Hall of Nations, what I found out was that it, it's an octahedron module and reading its geometry, uh, octahedron modules can have incircumscribed volumes and which, which where the volumes can intersect. 
and the volumetric nature and and this this is um, so I'm I'm not sure how many people have read about Zaha Hadid's uh, ventures and curves, but a lot of those projects may or may not follow these. But uh, a ground rule is to always mimic nature in the in the sense that nature has wealth itself, and there are a lot of structural principles that you can take from them. So analyzing Hall of Nations so is uh, analyzing the the geometry of Hall of Nations the dimensions, the, the functionality of it, and taking that further, understanding what that, that so octahedron modules is a part of platonic solids, and how these geometrical figures work was very important to understand the kind of translation I was planning of Hall of Nations into a current convent, uh, like uh, a current building, which later was to be a convention center. And so, and these platonic solids, can have incircumscribed volumes inside them. So if I had to put it very simply, if it's sounding way too complex, is having a framework around, and these red bubbles can become like the functions of the of the building. So I I, I did this uh, study of how these functions like I I don't I don't necessarily like the sketch anymore, but I like the idea that. These these uh, intersections can become functions which can have these interstitial spaces, whereas the outside of the geometry can can be the structure which holds it. And I took a lot of inspiration from the uh, from like the nature's principles, where I read about so bubble intersections and what's the right angle at which uh, these volumetric intersections should take place, which. Uh, and I actually went to a structural engineer as well to understand like how geometrical things work and are these principles good enough to be taken forward. I I mean it wasn't uh, it wasn't something I needed for my final thesis presentation, but it was something I was curious with. Like, can I just take this building and give it to someone who knows how to build it and it can be built? So I wanted to do all my study before that. Then. Um, so all these principles I use to make, uh, I use all of these principles to identify how and what are the sizes uh, that I would need in terms of going to a conventional study of a building, because a building needs uh, meeting rooms, it needs all, all sorts of ancillary rooms. So I classified it into big, medium, and small groups where how the inter intersection would happen between each of them. And then took those uh, modules into a general um, division of area where all the, so this this was a given guideline by the government, what, what all functions they wanted to have and what they were planning to have. So I took their brief and uh, inserted it into my geometrical study to identify whether this convention center can actually work as what the government was planning. And this led to a series of, uh, iterative iterations, which is like an, uh, like a, like a iterative study of how, uh, volumetrically, what are the possibilities of this particular building? And the, the four points that I mentioned here was lose the packing of modules, minimal surface, maximum material efficiency, maximum surface tension and programmatic relevance of modules. So there was a lot of, um, geometrical scientific study, which was, uh, coupled with, uh, and architectural intuition, so that it's it's like uh, because I was of the mindset at the uh, time that even though we there's a lot of computation and manual compu computation, um, the intuition that an architect has will still overpower that. So I did a lot of uh, sketches to identify. I think there were much more than these, but there were a lot of sketches which where I identified how I wanted that building to function and how it would be suitable for the people who are the end users. And eventually I reached to this plan of the building where at different levels, how the roof works versus how the functionality of the building is. Uh, that, that's something I dealt in. And that's that's in section how, how the roof would work and how how internally the the functions would connect and like how people would use it. 
And since there was an auditorium, I did an acoustic study, which was again, not, not a requirement for my final year's thesis, but I just wanted to understand like, uh, do, I mean, there are all sorts of acoustic engineers in professional, uh, like uh, when you go out, you wouldn't be doing this, but I just wanted to figure out, is it working or not? Am I, am I just being dreamy or am I being practical? And, and am I being able to rationalize and pragmatize what I've designed? And so that's that's uh, that's uh, how the structure and the and the panels uh, work according to uh, my research and how I dealt with sizes of how space frames work. And so this is Hall of Nations, and this is according to my zoning where my convention center would be. So what I wanted to do was create this this convention center which sits right next to Hall of Nations. Uh, like like a younger brother or a younger sister and kind of take all the principles that all of nations was built in but taking it one step further so a final product uh, was something that negotiated with the site rather than uh, necessarily getting rid of all of nations with the same area the same footprint but creating this path of homage to the to the existing and these were the few final renders. So this is this is where Hall of Nations is, and that's where I imagine my convention center to be. And it's it was very very at a very early stage. I would have I would have like looking at it right now with you guys. I I, I kind of feel like I want to take this one step uh, ahead. But I mean now my thesis is done. I don't necessarily want to do it. But that's that's the thing. The the date till your final submission hits is how much your building is designed. So I, I would want to do more, but yeah, that's, that's where it was. And that's how uh, that project happened. And this is something I would want to end my presentation with is it was actually a poster in my bedroom. I had multiple screenshots posters in my bedroom during my bachelor's thesis, and it really kept me going. So it was, it was something Steve Jobs said, I think in one of his presentations was have the courage to follow your heart and intuition. You somehow already know what you truly want to become. And there would be a lot of hurdles. I had a lot of hurdles, which I, I, I'm trying not to be more modest here, but there would be a lot of things that would affect how you function in an architectural school, outside architectural school, and once you become an architect. But the, the key is to just keep going. And yeah, that's me. I hope um, I was able to share as much as I thought I would. And I did justice. So thank you guys. Hello. Yes. Uh, thank you, Deepankar, for the wonderful Hello. presentation. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Explaining. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, yeah. I lost you for a while. Can you repeat that? Sorry, my bad. Yes, uh, I think you are done with the presentation, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, yes. That I was just saying it's a wonderful uh, presentation and explaining in detail all the uh, considerations mm -hmm. for the projects and what you have uh, done. Yeah. Uh, now okay. we'll have a question and answer sessions. Sure. Students, you can directly unmute yourself and ask, or you can type in the chat box any questions. And the students are as shy as I was when I was looking, I was hearing people talking. Asking like, questions. Sorry, I think oh, his voice is breaking. I think. Yeah, I think he's driving. His voice is breaking. Yeah. Uh, I was just saying that I think the students are as shy as I was. I, I would recommend them not to be shy at all. To be honest, like I'm one of those who never really used to ask, and now there's no stopping me. I, any architectural talk I go to, no matter who the person is, 
I just want to know how they did what they did. And I was, all, I'm always curious these days. So let's go for it. That's great. Anyone, uh, you can uh, interact and ask anything. It can be related to architecture, related to, uh, you know, studies, thesis projects, or the work culture there, anything, anything you can find out. Yes, uh, everyone, please don't hesitate to ask questions because the presenter who has shown all his journey is really incredible. And uh, like I have, like I have seen, we have studied together during our bachelors, and That's I have right. seen how <laughs> how we have like he has grown and how he evolved so well. And I really feel proud and blessed that I know him <laughs> since so many years. And, and uh, sorry, sorry, you go on. Like, sorry. No, no, you say, you say. No, I was, I was just saying that Smita has seen me from the days when. I wasn't doing really good in the architectural school when I was barely just passing versus to my thesis semester. It's, it's just, uh, you just fall in love with your work is basically what's changed. So I, that's, that's, I think what, what most of the students kind of, uh, would want to do if they want to do good work. You just, you just fall in love with your project. So all your, like most of the professors would be very usually mean to me, but I now understand why they were because I didn't understand. And once you start understanding and you educate yourself, all your professors start making sense to you. Like, uh, sorry, uh, in my second year, I said something to you, but now, uh, sorry, professor, I understand why you said what you said. So it's good. It's good. True, true. You are hundred percent true. Because during the uh, academics, some a standard is missing some kind of blunders if somebody commits there is no second uh, chance we will get we will find out only when somebody from site or some client identify that that's how we will get that repetition practically so we always uh, worried that if somebody identifies them in that situation it will be very absurd and uh, it's not good for their future. So we are worried. Absolutely. Absolutely. So any questions? Ishan, Anushri, Sagar, Harshita, Nadashri, Dayat. Uh, one question. Uh... Parker. Yes, sir. Yeah, so designing for the tangible seals is very, very evident. Like it's, uh, say, for example, if I design for a uh, auditorium, so capacity, and then the tangible is of a length by the target. But uh, designing for the intangibles is what is important, isn't it? The experience that we create in that auditorium, uh, the kind of experience we are looking at, that is what is very, very important. So. Uh, how do you think like uh, someone who's uh, planning architecture should uh, look at this uh, perspective like designing for the intangibles uh, the whole uh, effort should be for that isn't it? so any every, anyone can design for the tangibles but the intangibles is what is very important so how do you think students should uh, uh, work towards this um, yeah, yeah. So that are, that's actually a very, very uh, good point and a very interesting one because that's one of the questions that I think everyone struggles with, um, like as students and even as practitioners. And uh, what I feel is the key to uh, designing for intangible lies where you are designing. So the word, the overused word uh, that we use. Um, and which is probably the best word is context. All the all the answers that you are really searching for lie in the context. Like if, for example, in Dharavi, if I had to take it, um, I I would say that all the intangibles were actually amongst amongst uh, like what the people and their functioning was there. And when you when you are comparing uh, uh, 
a theater or acoustics or uh, if any of these um, um, areas that you're looking at and you want to design for the intangibles, you really need to read what the end user would want. Uh, I, if I were in that position, I would go to a hundred uh, theaters and see all the problems and all the, all the ways people function. And that's how, I mean, sometimes you wouldn't have time to do that much, but right now technology is at our disposal. So you can always try to understand who the end user will be and assume a little bit how the functioning would be. And you would be close enough. The key is to consider having those intangibles and uh, not just designing for tangibles, if, if, if I make sense, if I make any sense, sorry. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, it is very well said and really appreciated. And uh, so I think there are like, uh, I would like to share a key is, uh, uh, one experience. Like when I had uh, seen the banker, it's not exactly true that he was not doing so well or what, but one thing was that, that he was always a keen learner, like that learning part always I've observed in him. Like there is, he was never, uh, he would never stop himself for learning new, new things. And he was always eager to explore. And when I, when we all, like our batchmates saw him doing so well in his thesis and then how he flourished through all this years. So that was really a proud moment. And that also inspired me also to do masters that time. And I also wanted to, like he set an inspiration for many of us. So very very much proud of you, Dipankar. Very much. Uh, thank you so much, Signa. I hope. Uh, I mean, you are doing pretty well as well. So congratulations to you. Uh, I've I've seen you. your work as well. You you've done massively well. So thank you uh, for your kind words. Um, thank you. Wish you the same. Yes. <laughs> so uh, as uh, so, I would like to conclude this session. So, uh, and yes, uh, the recording will be shared on the YouTube link. So uh, students do feel free to connect with him. Like, do let me know if you wish to connect with him over mail. So I will share his email ID. And uh, sure. yes, so he will be really, uh, he's a great asset. Like if any query you have, he's ready to answer. So yes, I would uh, like to express my appreciation to all the participants who take out their time from the busy schedule. And also uh, thanks to our guest speaker who shared a broad spectrum of his knowledge. And uh, on behalf of Geetam School of Architecture, I would like to close my remarks and officially announce the end of the webinar. Wishing you all the future prosperity of, uh, and I further extend my gratitude to everyone, all the faculties, all the participants, all the students, our esteemed, and our esteemed speaker. Thank you for your attention. Stay safe, stay healthy, and signing off. This is your today's host, Thank Tara. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. Everyone. Thank you all. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Thank you, Deepankar. Uh, special Thank thanks. You, yeah. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you so much, Marangi. Bye.